Hi there and welcome. I'm Annie Rutherford. I'm a translator and I run Lighthouse's Women in Translation Book Club and I am absolutely thrilled to be here tonight virtually with Jennifer Craft to discuss her latest novel, The Extinction of Irina Rey. Uh, Jenny is an author and a translator from Polish, Ukrainian and Argentine Spanish. She's translated authors including Federico Falco and Violeta Gregg and won the International Booker Prize for her translation of Olga Togarczuk's Flights, um, as well as the William Sar Saroyan, so I wrote that down and I still got it wrong, International Prize for her debut, Homesick. And she has an upcoming translation with the wonderful Edinburgh-based publisher Charco, um, again with Federico Falco. So um, yeah, we're looking forward to that as well. Um, Jenny, welcome. It's so lovely to have you here tonight. Thank you so much, Annie. I'm so happy to be here and I'm so happy that we could make it work this week after last week's little time difference snafu, which you very helpfully put on. <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah, so um, thanks for everyone for bearing with us for a week. We hadn't quite realized until um, quite short notice that there is a short period of time when uh, the time differences between the UK and the US change. Uh, so that was what happened there. Um, the Extinction of Irina Rey is such an incredible novel. Um, I have annoyed multiple people talking about it nonstop for the last month. Um, it is hilarious. It is disconcerting. It's thought provoking. Um, it's about a group of translators converging on a house in Poland's Biewa Wieża, I have been yes. saying in my head. Beautiful. Yeah, perfect forest um only for their author to disappear and as their search for her grows ever more desperate the novel explores translation celebrity desire and the cultural and literal ecosystems that we find ourselves a part of um so yeah i think there's so much to talk about in the next hour um jenny and i will talk for about 45 50 minutes um we'll hear a couple of readings from the book within that and then we'll be opening up to questions. So do pop your questions in the chat on the website as we go along and the wonderful Jess from Lighthouse will feed those through to us. And um, yeah, we'll answer those towards the end of the event. Um, Jenny, can we start with a reading? I would love to start with a reading. So um, often I read just the very beginning of chapter one, but I am excited today to break with tradition, the weeks old tradition of doing that. And instead, start at the actual beginning, which is the translator's preface, which is actually not called a preface or a note. It's called a warning. Warning. Note from the translator. This has been the hardest book I've ever had to translate. Since trust is crucial to every stage of the translation process, I feel I owe it to the English language reader to explain. First. One of Extinction's main characters is based on me. Should you choose to keep reading, how uncomfortable this was for me to translate will be clear as crystal. Then again, as someone who dedicates a lot of thought to word choice, I realized uncomfortable might not be quite the right word. It was uncomfortable to read a version of myself I couldn't recognize. But translation isn't reading. Translation is being forced to write a book again. The Extinction of Irina Ray required me to recreate myself as the worst person in the narrator's world, the monster who seems to want to ruin everything. Worse or more uncomfortable, my character's physical appearance is frequently praised. For obvious reasons, beautiful people don't go around describing themselves as beautiful. So by obligating me to do so, the author of Extinction made me feel ugly in real life. Second, Part of the plot is inspired by true events, and although I can't say which part, I can say that my partner is a lawyer, an excellent lawyer with extensive experience in criminal defense, and that we live in Mongolia, which has no extradition treaty with Poland or, for that matter, the United States. Third, the extinction was written in Polish, but its author was born and raised in South America, where she grew up in almost total ignorance of any of the languages of Central Europe. As a result, each of this book's original sentences is like a tiny haunted house. Angered by her efforts to forget it, the spirit of Spanish comes whooshing through the walls of every paragraph, breaking plates and continually flicking the light switch, creating an atmosphere of wrongness and scaring the shit out of everyone's dog. 
By correcting word order and register, my translation aims to exorcise the neighborhood. Last, I have retitled the novel. I mention this only because my decision to do so has already drawn critiques from certain Polish corners of the internet. But this author's own title, which was Amadou, failed to convey the moral and intellectual rigor of its true subject, the 2026 Nobel laureate, Irina Ray. Had I taken my title from the kingdom of fungi, I would have opted not for some unspectacular parasite, but rather the reishi or Amanita virosa, or maybe the magnificent split gill, a mushroom found on every continent except Antarctica, where lichens reign. For more on this, please see Arena Ray's Kernel of Light in my translation. This is the least the author could have done. For the split gill can be 23,328 different sexes, each of which is able to mate with any of the 23,327 that it is not. Maybe translation does blur the boundaries of selfhood, as this novel suggests. But if so, then it also blurs the boundaries of otherness, which this story, with its, with its inexplicable fixation on one admittedly attractive man, seems completely unequipped to comprehend. I have chosen, on the other hand, extinction to foreground Irina's primary concern over the past 10 or so years. Our sixth extinction, the future of the planet, owning up to what we've done. One final note about pronunciation. In Polish, as in German, the W is pronounced like a V. The Polish L with a line through it is pronounced like the W in wet. The Z, the Z with a dot over it, is pronounced like the S in treasure, if you keep reading. And I cannot stress that if enough. It is my hope that you'll remember the phrase wet V treasure whenever you arrive at Białowieża, the name of the imperiled border forest I barely escaped after over seven toxic, harrowing, oddly arousing, extremely fruitful weeks. Alexis Archer, Ulan Batar, April 13th, 2027. And then we have a picture to indicate the beginning of the novel. Amazing, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, I feel like this is such a good introduction to to so much of the setup of the novel so there are kind of various layers going on and that we have these this sense of the the real events although we don't never quite know what those are we've got this fictional novel written in polish by emi irina Rey's spanish translator and then we have alexis's english translation um complete with some beautifully snarky footnotes which uh, brought me a lot of joy throughout the novel um, and I wanted to start off by asking, how did you approach those different layers to the narrative? Like, did you always have Alexis's voice and Emmy's re reactions to things going through at the same time, or did you kind of build up? Yeah, initially, I I just had Emmy as the narrator, and you know, I had a lot of different goals and interests, of course, with this project. I think. Um, yeah, one thing it is not is like succinct or like especially focused. So you can see that there was a lot going on. Um, but one of those things what had to do with kind of foregrounding the activity of translation and and especially the activity of translators. So I wanted um I wanted a drama between translators and I I wrote the whole first draft kind of thinking about that but then I felt like it wasn't enough for there to be all of this conflict on the page I also wanted it to be embedded in this in you know the very words that people are reading and I wanted people to be constantly reminded of the absolute power of the translator who has of course the last word who chooses every single word of the book that you're reading when you read a translation which I think so frequently gets, that's the thing that gets lost in translation is just like this idea of the person who's mediating this experience for you and who has done this really important and meaningful collaboration with the author. Um, so once I kind of made that decision that Alexis's voice would also be present in the text, then as I revised, yes, there was just like the two of them constantly going back and forth and I started to really enjoy it. I would say something serious as Emmy 
and then immediately think of like how to take that apart um, as Alexis. So yeah, it was a fun, it's definitely a fun setup for me. I hope other people find it humorous as well. I, I felt that that really came across and it's such a, it's such a clever way of exploring the different approaches to translation without that me feeling academic, which I think is a very hard thing to do. Yeah, that was another goal for sure. Yeah, thank you. I felt as well that, so the setup with Irina and her translators is this, um, it felt to me a little bit like a gleeful satire of how I think people often assume that translators and authors interact. Um, was that intentional? Of course, yeah. I mean... Yes, I also just feel like, um, so the Nana Kwame Aji Brenya blurbed the book, which was so exciting when that happened. I really love his work. And he has said um, that he he feels like taking things to extreme and fiction and um, incorporating elements of the absurd is actually, for him, um, a more direct way, oddly, to talk about things that are really important that people may have become inured to. So they need this kind of jolt of another perspective. Um, so yeah, I definitely, it's a satire. It's it's an homage to the absurd um, for its own sake and also kind of in all of the writers that I that I really admire. Um, Vitold Gombrowicz, the Polish Argentine writer is a big influence here in this book. Um, so yes. Intentional. Um, it made me think actually really of Muriel Spark, who I think is also just so fantastic for those absurd groups of people and the way that they they interact. Um, obviously also a, a wonderful Edinburgh writer as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with Alexis and Emmy, we've kind of got two opposing approaches to translation that Emmy's very horrified that Alexis might ever, ever deign to change a single word. And she's got some wonderful lines again that um, yeah, I feel kind of really reflects how people sometimes think about translation of we treated her every word as sacred, even though our whole task was to replace her every word, um, which I think is a, a beautiful juxtaposition. And then we have a much kind of freer approach by Alexis, who sort of feels that to be faithful to a text, you have to move away from it. Um, and I thought this was really interesting in terms of kind of the power dynamics around translation obviously Alexis is translating into English that is a language with a lot of power on the world stage and yeah again I think this is a line of Emmys of um, what Alexis really wanted to do was to civilize Irina's text exactly as you would expect a US usurper to do which we of course also have in that warning of the idea of exercising the haunted house um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those power dynamics yeah, that was one of the things that I was so interested in exploring with this group of translators. <laughs> um, one of the things that happened that gave me the idea for this book was that I I did get to meet Olga Tukar, six other translators, not all of them. But at the time, there were, I can't remember what year this was, but it was like at least a decade ago that we started meeting. Um, and I was just so fascinated, you know, by this, by this grouping, by these very intelligent and creative people who are only together because of a single extraordinary and charismatic figure who has brought them together. And everyone was so nice and so supportive. And we talked so much and, and it was, yeah, it was just so much fun. But in the end, everything kept coming back to, of course, to Olga, which was what had brought us together. And I just kept wondering, like, what would happen if we took that figure out? Would there be, are there any underlying, I have absolutely no indication of this being the case, to be clear, but are there any underlying jealousies or resentments? If, I don't know how I would feel if one of the translators won a 25,000 pound half of an international booker. Um, and here I am like doing the same work um, in Serbia and what do I get? Um, so I don't know, yeah, I, I knew all along that I definitely didn't want our main narrator to be the English language translator because I did want to look at that pretty carefully. Obviously Spanish is also a language of empire um, and a European language that was imposed upon 
the people of the Americas. Uh, so, you know, it's not like a, a battle between them for virtue, linguistic purity or anything like that. Um, but it, it just, it does help to have a little bit of a remove in thinking about the extreme power of English because it really does carry so much more weight than translation into any other language. There are these prizes like the International Booker, but also, you know, once an author from a so-called minor language like Polish is translated into English, it's much easier for them to be translated into other languages, whether from Polish, because the pub publisher can read the English language translation and kind of monitor the reviews, or direct or from the English language translation as some of um, the translations of flights uh, have been done. So I know that the Arabic translation of flights and the Chinese translation of flights are from, are actually translations of my translation, which is um, maybe a, a whole, an entire additional conversation thinking mm -hmm. about that. But but yeah, I, I, I really, it's not a question that I can solve. Like I can't really do anything myself um, about the current lingua franca of the literary world. I'll, I mean, maybe this is like my very slight contribution. Kutsia, um, the South African Nobel Prize winner, as you probably know, Annie, he um, has spent a lot of our time in Argentina and he considers, he calls the Spanish language translations the originals of his work and he has them published first. They come out before the English versions. Um, and the translations are done by a wonderful Argentine writer named Mariana Dimopoulos. Um, and they just wrote a book together. But that's another kind of like activism on behalf of, I don't know, just putting English in its place a little bit, even though he, he has chosen to continue to write in English. That's really fascinating. Um, yeah. I, yeah, no, I feel like the, the novel gets into that so interestingly. I feel there's so much to unpick. Um, yeah, so, ah, so much happens at the end of the book that we can't really talk about. I know. <laughs> um, which I'm going to struggle slightly with, but without giving anything away, I and mean, like I mentioned, there's this kind of very, um, yeah, slightly satirical setup with the author that she's very revered, the translators at first kind of, I share her opinions because it is mandatory not to disagree and they all know each other by just by the name of their language. Um, and then this kind of falls apart gradually as she's away. And I thought one of the things that was really fun in the novel is that we often have this like cliched idea of the translator as the traitor. And in some ways that gets flipped on its head in this book um, or very much interrogated. Was that intentional or was that just something that kind of happened along the way? Well, yeah, I mean, betrayal, this idea of betrayal is at the uh, at the heart of the book. Um, and it goes hand in hand with an investigation of originality. And that has to do with the setting as well. You know, like we're in this so-called last original forest in Europe, last primeval forest in Europe, which in theory means that, um, you know, the forest is pure to go back to that word, um, which I think is an important one, because there's this idea with translation that the, you know, the text has been contaminated, or in some way, it's adulterated, and we can no longer trust it, mm -hmm. whether or not like the translator has good intentions, and is trustworthy in that sense, the translation is polluted, um, in a way that the original is not. And I think that's such a bizarre holdover from a completely different mindset that we don't have like thinking about how we approach going to the cinema we are not expecting that the film has been made by one person we're expecting that it's been made by a whole team of people um and that is a good thing and so yeah i wanted to um of course like again bring the activity of the translator and the collaborative enterprise of of translators to the fore um, and then undermine this notion of original, you know, in terms of the forest, there have been human beings living in that area for many thousands of years. Nothing is, those aren't the original trees that were, like, 
original to what, I guess. Mm. And, you know, when we think about original text, um, there were so many drafts, so many versions. Things are always collaborative. They're always edited. Um, I mean, maybe not always, but often they're edited. And the editor can have a huge impact on the evolution of the text. Other people can as well. Um, things are maybe workshopped or shared with friends. And people take ideas from so many different sources. Um, and I guess the original thing is how they put them together. But this is, of course, something that comes up increasingly as the book goes on in terms of Irina's um, unacknowledged sources. Um, and, you know, yes, the question is like, who is betraying whom? Maybe everyone is betraying everyone. Maybe no one is betraying anyone. Kind of a stolen open question. Um, you talked a little bit about the forest there, so maybe we could hear a, a reading in that setting. That would be great. This seems like it's a spoiler, um, but it's not much of one. I think this is mentioned throughout the text that this is going to happen, and it's not the end. Um, it seems like it might be the ending, but it isn't. Um, so this is the... Emmy, the Spanish language translator, and her translator, Alexis, the English language translator, um, have been fighting more and more. Things have been worsening, and they finally come to a head. And Emmy challenges Alexis to a duel, and not a metaphorical duel, but just an actual pistols at dawn, literal pistols at dawn duel um, at the entrance to the strict reserve, which is the most protected part of the Białowieża forest on the Polish side. Um, so this is kind of midway through the duel. A white-backed woodpecker investigated all that underlay the snow. This is also the first time that it snows. So one of the th things that happens over the course of this book is that all of the usual weather patterns are undermined by climate change. Um, and that has um, all kinds of different consequences. But finally, the morning of the duel, it had snowed. A white-backed woodpecker investigated all that underlay the snow, bobbing its scarlet cap. A willow warbler that ought to have departed by now for Tanzania hopped from branch to branch, flicking the snow off a spruce with its feet. I immediately lost track of how many steps I had taken and how many I had left. I just kept walking, taking ever smaller steps. The gun was in my right hand. It dangled from my trigger finger the way a shopping bag with tomatoes in it might. I heard the guttural trill of a boreal owl. Stop, said Schultz, and I stopped. I stood at the very edge of the forest, shouldering the snow. The ferns were so beautiful, they seemed eternal. I was sure I could not turn to face Alexis, that I would not be able to point my gun at her, even raise it from the snow on the ground. But from inside the forest, I heard a crackling, and my eyes started up, and I hoped I would see Freddy, and my mind flooded with gratitude, gratitude that he hadn't yet found his way back to Bogdana, who would eventually cause him to lose the physical memory of me. But instead, I saw Leshy, reduced to the size of a pine marten, here to protect us or protect the forest from us, or just to watch us, to be able to tell Irina what had happened, in case one or both of us, or all of us, perished in the snow. I was struck by a feeling of pride. I was here to defend our author's honor and perhaps by extension, my own. There. Um, thank you. I um, Yeah, I have to confess when the original invitation to the duel was sent, I was like, oh, it's clearly metaphorical, right? <laughs> nope. Yeah, it was very important to me to get some ladies pointing guns at each other in this book. That was nice. Essential. Um, I really loved that moment because you kind of see this blurring between, I don't know, sort of the internal and the external world, I assume. And there's this character, Leshy, who they've encountered before and have kind of decided is this forest deity um, suddenly in a different shape. And it's sort of, it all feels very present. Um and I feel like boundary blurring is really important throughout the book. So we've got that mention again in the, the translator's warning of translation blurring the boundaries of otherness. Um, and I feel like that really comes up in the sense 
of the forest as this network and also the kind of repeated talk about fungi and mycelium as a network. Um, was that something you were looking to explore or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's, that's sort of like the heart of all of my work is this question of like, how can one be a self, um, but also a connected, connected to others. And I guess, you know, if you, if you kind of push it, if you push selfhood, it collapses. I mean, I, I think, you know, like it's very hard to think of ourselves as selves in light of the fact that we're inhabited by all of these other organisms in light of, you know, how essential um, our interactions with others are and how the kind of impact that that makes on us, et cetera. So I think also the dual is like a, a prime, um, place to explore this because this is a you know this is a an occasion where one person to defend their honor which is like defending your integrity or yourself um is ready to obliterate this other person's self or honor or integrity um and yeah i just you have to have like so much faith in that possibility of selfhood um, I think to engage in a duel, and that's something that Emmy has. Emmy has this hope that there are clear boundaries between things, um, even though we see her boundaries kind of dissolving after the author's departure. So, um, yeah. Whereas, whereas of course, Alexis is much freer and kind of more willing to go with the flow, and she's sort of baffled by this idea of a duel, or even by the animosity that Emmy is kind of consistently expressing toward her. Um, there's a really a bit that I like stuck a post at him when I was reading is um, Emmy talking about Alexis laughing nervously and there's just a footnote from Alexis going I'm trying to get rid of this habit and I it was sort of the moment that really tipped my sympathy for her because I just thought oh god reading that about yourself when it's, you know it's something that you don't like about yourself it felt very um harrowing in a way yeah I think that was actually the first footnote that I wrote um yeah I because I I also I mean Alexis is so over the top and um you know she's a ridiculous figure but also I do really feel for her I have a lot of sympathy for her and became very fond of her and yeah I mean that if you've ever encountered yourself in someone else's description whether it's in a book or you know you overhear something or whatever it's it can be really mortifying and, and that certainly happens to her here absolutely um one of the going back to the fungi fungi one of the central metaphors of the novel is this amadou <laughs> um which i'm gonna let you explain because i just have lots of bullet points and um, but i was wondering if you could yeah talk a little bit about the meaning of it for the novel yeah so um i said that one of the things that caused me to write the novel was meeting Olga's other translators and we met a few different times in different cities of Poland. Um, another thing was that in 2017, which is when the book is set, which is an important year for the forest because it's the year when the Polish government begins logging in the national park. Um, I went back to Białowieża. I hadn't been there in a long time and I was just kind of like looking around with a national park worker. We were in the strict reserve and um, he pointed out this creature to me, which looked like a severed horse's hoof and it was like tacked to a tree trunk. And I was so, I hadn't really noticed anything like that before, or maybe I actually hadn't seen it. Although once I saw it, saw it it's one of those things that like, once you learn the word, you suddenly hear it and see it everywhere. Um, now these, uh, bracket fungi are like such a part of my life that I do see them everywhere. But um, yeah, I was really struck by its slightly horrifying appearance, but also kind of magical appearance. And um, it was called Fomus fomentarius. It's an interesting fungus because it starts its life as a parasite, as Alexis mentions in her morning. Um, and it, it attaches, it grows on um, diseased trees and it kills them. Um, 
And then it, the fungus, transforms into a decomposer. So once the tree is dead, it does this, it performs this essential service to the entire forest ecosystem of decomposing the tree to enrich, of course, the soil that then benefits all of the other plants and animals and fungi. Um, so that struck me as like a, a richer metaphor for the activity of translation than all of the uniformly positive metaphors that I had been thinking about before. Um, and then the other fascinating thing about this fungus is that it is used with very slight, very uh, rudimentary chemical treatment at to start fires. Um, and in that capacity, it's called Amadou. So it was used everywhere for many thousands of years before we had matches. It was because it, it can catch the spark if you just, you know, get sparks going in a snowstorm. The Amadou can catch the spark much more easily than anything else. And of course, like you would be keeping it dry because you're carrying it with you. Um, and then it'll smolder and you can use it to cook or to warm yourself. It's a really like such an important part of human life that then almost completely disappeared. Like we don't know what this is anymore. Um, it, the material can also be used to stand in for leather or to staunch wounds, or you can use it um, when you go fishing. I mean, it can be, it's so, such a wonderful Thing that is kind of a shapeshifter itself, which is something that we're, you know, already thinking about in terms of leshy and translation and so forth. Um, and it was almost, it was over harvested. It was almost driven to extinction in the 19th century. And then it was replaced by matches. Um, however, now it's coming back um, and scientists are, you know, testing it for all kinds of potential uses. And already it's been identified as a possible replacement for certain kinds of plastic and construction materials, which is really exciting. Um, so I just think it's a wonderful little creature. And I, I actually did title my novel Amadou. Um, it wasn't only Emmy um, who thought of this and uh, my editor made me change it, but um, <laughs> I would still call it Amadou if given the chance. Um, I love that you still managed to sneak it into the book as a, a fictional title in that case. I think that was actually his idea because he knew how reluctant I was to lose it. So this was the consolation prize that I got. Nice. I thought it was actually really interesting in the preface that the way that Alexis um, explained her changing of the title because it meant when I kind of went back to the beginning after finishing the novel, I thought, okay, I'm not actually sure that she's understood. And I, I thought it was really interesting because I'd kind of grown more and more sure that maybe actually Alexis knew what she was talking about and Emmy didn't. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I thought, actually, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody knows what they're talking about in this book. No, it was it was a beautiful moment of destabilization. That's and, great. Yeah, I love that. Um, One of the things that also gets mentioned is sort of fungi being the first often to inhabit traumatized landscapes and obviously the landscape of Biorovija is full of a lot of very violent historical acts and there's mentions of kind of Nazi hunters and Nazis who are hunters not hunters of Nazis yeah. or, so that's unclear um and that kind of yeah very very violent act um, and I know that's something you mention in your afterward to the novel of kind of thinking about the history that that landscapes carry with them. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how that fed into the book. Yeah, um, that I think is partly because I, I have translated work by this wonderful Polish scholar and academic, Roma Sandyka, who works on um, landscape and memory or non-memory, places of non-memory. So there's this idea, of course, of like, commemorative there, there are monuments and there are spaces that are intended to provoke reflection and commemoration and then there are also all of these spaces that are just they they were the sites of potentially um terrible things and uh the question is like how how is that terror reflected 
in the nature of the landscape itself, and if it is. Um, and I think her research suggests that it is, um, that there is some kind of landscape memory um, that can signal, you know, certain kinds of stressors over time to animals and plants and um, and then to like the local humans who are actually attuned to what's going on here. So um, yeah, they, the, the translators have conversations about, about, I guess, yeah, what it means to inhabit a space of trauma and also to kind of consume that space and digest that space and to transform that space in some way, um, which also has to do with translation. Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, I hadn't really thought about the fact until you were talking there of, there are these kind of places and spaces of memory in the book, obviously, of there's the visits to the cemetery and the visit to the ooh, national national day of remembrance of something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which I've clearly that's noticed. Exactly what about. I remember of it as well. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and then, yeah, it's kind of the ideas of how the, the memories and the violence actually seep out of those or they're not necessarily those aren't the moments that we're most kind of interrogating these ideas which I think is um yeah well, was really fascinating um I can see we've got a few questions in the chat already so I might move over to these if you've got more questions feel free to pop them into the website um sorry I'm not on the website so I can't tell you what it looks like but hopefully it's really clear um and yeah again Jess will pop them in the zoom chat for us um so starting off with a question from Sarah, um, who says she's interested to hear how isolation played into the ideas that you've been talking about, given the forest setting. Um, yes. I was just going to pull up the chat. But... <laughs> it, um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. The way that they're isolated, so of course, the forest is not an isolating place or experience at all. Everything is kind of in constant contact with everything else. And especially in a place like the primeval forest, there is so much biodiversity that there's such a density of animals and plants and fungi that it does feel just like you can't you can't take like a slight step without encountering other beings, which is um, you know, a little bit overwhelming. But and also wonderful. Um, but the translators, of course, work in relative isolation and they are in the village isolated. They're, you know, because the arena has disappeared, their author has vanished without a trace and they no longer know exactly what they're doing. They're no longer sure if they're gonna be perceived as visitors in this village or more like invasive species. Um, and they don't. They don't really know how to read the current politics of Poland. And so they really kind of close themselves up. They do some initial, very superficial searching for her, but then they kind of like seal themselves up in her home. Um, also because they're so obsessed with her, of course, and they want to kind of like um, live and breathe Irina Ray um, in this like moment of unique access to all of her stuff. Um, but yeah, I wanted to, I needed them to be in a little bit of isolation in order to make them go crazy um, in a, in the span of just a few weeks, and especially to make my narrator, Emmy, um, just really, really, really hate. I feel like the kind of hatred that she develops for Alexis that results in this duel can only be developed at very close quarters. Like anyone who who grew up with a sibling, especially if you shared a room with that sibling, like you know that there are these moments where you just like, even if the person hasn't actually done anything wrong, you just cannot stand this the existence of this person. Um, so that was part of it. And then I also wrote the book in isolation. I wrote the first draft in a Swiss treehouse in the fall of 2020 when we were all in isolation that year um and that was a great experience because I you know my only interlocutors were my were my characters so I really felt like I I kind of like gave them the room to run wild 
but I was, yeah, definitely in isolation then. Um, I still, every time I hear mention of the Swiss treehouse, I'm just intensely jealous. <laughs> um, a question from Chris. Uh, when you were writing the book, did you imagine fellow translators reading it and did that impact the writing? I was imagining that. I was more speaking to, I mean, this goes back to this question of like, is the writing academic or not? It, it, it is, I did consider writing a, not, a work of nonfiction about translation and approaches to translation and approaches to selfhood and otherness. And um, I decided against it, at least for the time being, because I wanted, I didn't want to just be preaching to the choir. So of course, translators all have such different, you know, relationships to all of these questions. And um, it's not that I think that I'm speaking for everyone in this book, but I think it is addressed more toward an audience that is, you know, super, super intelligent and um, curious, but maybe hasn't spent as much time thinking about um, about what translation entails. It's more to kind of bring that to their attention. Um, I, obviously, I want translators to read it. I love the idea of translators reading it, and I would love to hear uh, how people are feeling about it. But um, that wasn't part of my uh, project, I guess. I wasn't trying to perform a, the same service for translators that I was trying to perform for general readership. That's really interesting because one of, um, I think Alexis's longest footnote, which is like half a page, um, which I forced my flatmate to read because I was just crackling so much. Um, but she ends that by saying that she's trying to, like the person she's trying to do right by is her ideal reader. And she just says like, my ideal reader, colon, you, which I thought was fascinating as the reader of the book because you're kind of like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you. Um, yeah, and I, I wondered whether you, like, do you have a sense of who Alexis's ideal reader is or? Hmm. Who is Alexis's ideal reader? That's a great question. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, her, yeah, she has such a particular personality. She's so, um, you know, she's so kind of contemporary. She's obsessively like up to date and um, she's quite, willing to mock those who are not. She feels like Emmy is outdated and Emmy feels like that's also kind of an imperialist, whatever, just because Alexis has more money and she can afford new things doesn't mean that they're better. Um, but it, yeah, I feel like she would be speaking to her, the people she considers to be her peers, which would be like a, a relatively affluent, um, well-educated, U.S. and then Australian, because that's where her partner is from, readers of international fiction, which would not be Emmy's target reader. That's really interesting. Um, cool. Um, so we have one more question that's coming through the chat. So again, if you do have questions, feel free to pop them in. And otherwise, I'm just going to keep on asking things. So um, we're doing great. But yeah, Beth asks... Uh, you said that Alexis makes sure her voice comes through in the translation. In your own translation work, do you feel like you have your own voice or do you actively try to assert it? I, yes, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to make clear is that uh, I definitely think that there is no way for a translator to just kind of like convey a text without putting their own mark on it. I mean, translators are human beings for the most part. Um, and so we have our subjectivities and we have our politics and we have our agendas, whether we're even consciously aware of them or not. So um, it's not about actively asserting my voice. It's just, I, I recognize that my voice is certainly present on the page because I wrote those words. Um, and so, you know, my goal is to just make sure that that voice is in harmony with the authors <laughs> and the characters. Um, but, 
yeah I think I do think that that's inevitable and I do know that there are translators who disagree with that as well um but I I think that it is also kind of politically meaningful to signal that not as Alexis does but just to kind of I mean I think translators names should be on book covers I think translators notes are always appreciated um but I think definitely you know saying this book was originally written in X language very clearly up front to the reader is essential um as a way I mean it does so many different things it it you know um brings a spotlight to languages that US or UK readers might not even have heard of. Um, it also forces publishers to maybe diversify their lists a little bit if that's not the case, if everything's coming from French or whatever. Um, and it it show, it tells you something about the identity of the translator and there should of course be like the bio as well. And, um, and that may tell you, and you can Google and you can find interviews with them that may tell you something about you know, their beliefs and what they may have imparted to the translation. And that way you can use your own judgment to kind of determine um, what's theirs or what's the original language authors, if that is even extricable. Um, so yeah, I think voice, the voice of the translator is always there. And I think it's better to acknowledge that than not. Um, I think that's really interesting, the thing of making it clear what language your book is from, because I don't know if this is the case in the, the Polish and Spanish markets, but definitely in Germany, you get a lot of books by German authors with pseudonyms as to make them seem like English language authors or um, like regional crime novels that are set in like south of France or Italy that have kind of pseudonyms that are French and Spanish names and Italian names. Wow. Um, yeah. Kind That's of fascinating. So deceptive. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's like this specific, specific sense that actually something from out with Germany is more, more exciting and more interesting, which I've not come across elsewhere. Mm. Question from Nish. I'm really curious about the duel. <laughs> um, it sounds like there was a lot of fun in writing that. Where does that fascination come from? I'm trying to think when it began. So I actually wrote my PhD dissertation about duels in 20th century fiction. I mean, it's, I think it does have to do with my interest in selfhood and like how we came to think of ourselves as selves and how we came to define ourselves in such a way um, as to be able to incite this kind of violence. I just think forms of violence in general interest me. I mean, obviously horrify me, but um, I think the forms are interesting, like, you know, I'm on a university campus right now in the United States, one form of violence that has come to people's attention quite frequently in the last, I don't know, 20 years is school shootings, um, which is such a, it seems like such a random, again, horrifying um, and terrible thing, but it's also so random. Like how did this become the thing that people do in the US? Um, Whereas like Americans are relatively well behaved at things like sporting events, which in other countries can um, can be a place of a lot of violence. Um, so yeah, the duel fascinated me because it was it was so common for so long to us. It seems basically unthinkable, I think, to most of us. Um, and yet, writers continued to include scenes of duels. What I mean until now, obviously I've just done it. Um, but I was really interested. In, I mean, Borges obsessively wrote about duels. Bolaño also, and then Vito Gombrovich, uh, the Polish Argentine writer I mentioned before. Nabokov, Conrad, Chekhov, all of these people. Like after people stopped really fighting duels, they continued to appear in fiction, and so I wondered. Um, yeah, just what what is what can a duel tell us about who a character is, who they think they are, who the author thinks they are, et cetera. And I think it's a really effective um, way of addressing those questions. 
That's really fascinating. Thank you. Um, I think unless any more questions come in from the chat, we'll finish up with a couple of last questions. Um, one of my other favourite footnotes um, was fairly near the beginning of the novel, and Emmy's mentioned that um, Irene Ray doesn't think much of authors who write in a language that isn't their own, but obviously is herself writing in a language that isn't her native tongue. And Alexis has a footnote kind of commenting on this and saying, is mother tongue still in any way a valid category? The implication that we are born into a certain language the way we're born into a body, but even our bodies can be modified and families moved into new linguistic territories and some families fall apart. Um, and then ends with quite a dismissive note about the novel itself. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought it was a really, it was very interesting given that at the start of the novel, the translators are all still referring to themselves by their languages. Um, and that is such a central marker of identity at that point. And I was wondering whether you were sort of trying to unpick ideas around relationship and language there, relationship with language. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I should quickly add to the, to my answer to the last question also, because I, I didn't quite get to the fun aspect of it. I did, um, so I was in Switzerland, as previously mentioned, and I'm um, terrified of heights. So the way that I I tried to get some adrenaline working in my system, because otherwise I was just like in my beautiful tree house drinking amazing Swiss tea. Um, I took a train up to the very top of a mountain and I started writing the theme there and then um, continued working on it at this wonderful art museum outside of Basel that was just like I I don't remember what the exhibit was but it was just a huge room of these amazing blue enormous blue paintings um so yeah it was a lot of fun to write I really enjoyed actually getting to be terrified at the top of the Swiss mountain and um trying to just transpose that onto a scene of someone pointing a gun at you and you pointing a gun at them so the mother tongue thing is something that I'm really interested in, and I'm going to explore more in my um, in my coming work. I wrote that footnote not in the first draft before I had children, but in the who knows which draft after I had children. Um, and I'm really fascinated. This is a you know something that I have been really wary and suspicious of for a very long time, but. Now that I'm watching my kids develop language, I'm even more suspicious because I just feel like there's this connotation of with mother tongue or even native language of like, yeah, it's such a natural process. You are kind of born into it and maybe you absorb it in utero. Maybe you get it through the mother's breast milk, but like somehow it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the intellectual processes of learning a language in school, for instance. Those seem, people, the, I think those terms put them in a totally different category and people really separate them. And that, it leads to so many different things. I mean, it, this idea of like the noble mother tongue um, and nothing else can compete with that, but also, you know, if your mother tongue is not English, for instance, it has been in the just the field of literary translation, it has been really difficult to get the the respect that you deserve. Um, I mean, even thinking of just my husband, Boris Faluk, who's an amazing translator who spent the first eight years of his life speaking not a word of English. Um, I feel like he has faced this like ridiculous kind of discrimination in the field of literary translation on the basis of his name or his status as an immigrant. I mean, less so obviously now that he's more established, but um, yeah, it just, that kind of stuff is so bizarre to me. And um, and I think, as I say, I'll be definitely tackling more of that in, in work about my own kids, but also just kind of in general about, about language and how we think about it. Well, it's always exciting to hear what's to come. So thank you. Um, and just one final question. Um, Lighthouse did a really lovely post in the run up to the event of other other books about translation. And I wondered if you had any favourites, either fiction or nonfiction, of books around translation and translating. 
I do. I really love uh, Kate Briggs, this little art. That's just such a wonderful, I see that you agree with me. I, I don't think I've ever met a person who has read it and said like, oh yeah, it wasn't that good. Like if you've read the book, <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> it's an amazing book and it's unique. Like I really appreciate that about it too. It's just so refreshing. I can't really compare it to any other book. Um, and yeah, it's just wonderful on so many levels. So that's, that's definitely what comes to mind as my favorite book about translation. What What about you, though? I love that. I am um, really <laughs> way to make Jess awkward. He's lurking in the chat. I really love Jess's debut novel, How We Are Translated, which is isn't so much about translation, but is about language and how we the the main the narrator is um, Swedish living in Edinburgh and her partner has decided to learn Swedish by immersing himself and she's not that thrilled about it and kind of how how we relate to languages and how we relate to languages and with different people and I I loved that I really like Marie Genzel's um translation as transhumans uh, yeah. which I think is I mean obviously I, I translate from German and she draws a lot on on German history and German poetry so there was a lot to connect with but I think it's got really beautiful thoughts in but yeah Kate Briggs's book I think was the first book that I read about translation that really yeah just kind of had that spark I think um, yeah I, I mean there are actually like a a lot of works I love that list um that White House put together it has some titles that I wasn't familiar with. Um, I just read a book that's coming out later this year called Misinterpretation by an Albanian American writer named Lydia Hoga, uh, which is, I'm gonna need to look up how to spell that really quickly, but um, it, Misinterpretation is about an interpreter um, rather than a translator, but it was such a fascinating kind of journey through, and also the, this question of translating trauma um, is very present in that um as well I know we're out of time I shouldn't have brought up another <laughs> you're all good we've got time for this so it is yeah that's x-h-o-g-a um this is the last name of the author Lydia Hoga I'm assuming that I don't speak Albanian um but you should read the book if you are interested in um interpreting as well as translation incredible well thank you so much um yeah thank you jenny this has been um yeah wonderful and fascinating and insightful i really hope everyone goes away and reads the book partly so that i can scream about it to you that would be that would be great i would appreciate yeah. that um so thank you so much for taking the time thanks to lighthouse for organizing this and of course to scribe 